Hi everyone, my name is Donna Lyons and I'm an academic at the School of Law, Trinity College Dublin. You're very welcome to seminar six in our speaker series. Today I have the great honour of welcoming Professor Noam Chomsky and Professor Robert Pollan to Trinity College Dublin. Noam Chomsky is Institute Professor Emeritus at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and Laureate Professor at the University of Arizona. Professor Chomsky is author of American Power and the New Mandarins and Manufacturing Consent with Ed Herman, among many other books. He is a linguist, a historian, a philosopher, and a cognitive scientist who has risen to prominence as a political activist and as the world's leading public intellectual. Robert Pollan is Distinguished University Professor of Economics and founding co-director of the Political Economy Research Institute at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Professor Pollan is a renowned progressive economist and has many books, including Contours of Dissent and Greening the Global Economy. He has worked as a consultant for the US Department of Energy, the International Labour Organization, the United Nations Industrial Development Organization and numerous NGOs around the world. Foreign Policy Magazine selected him as one of the 100 leading global thinkers for 2013. So I'm very privileged to be discussing climate crisis and the global green new deal with its authors, Professor Chomsky and Professor Pollan this evening. This is an extraordinary and compelling book which maps out the catastrophic consequences of unchecked climate change and presents a realistic blueprint for change in the form of the Green New Deal. So without further ado, I will start off with a question for Professor Chomsky. So perhaps understandably, the world appears to be all consumed by the coronavirus pandemic and its implications. Would it be your view that the climate emergency is in fact a much more serious and urgent threat at this time? The only thing that compares with it is the growing threat of nuclear war. Uh, the two of these are threats that essentially uh, threaten to terminate human life on Earth in any recognizable sense. Uh, the, uh, and there, with regard to the climate crisis, we have a couple of decades maybe in which we can deal with it. If we fail to do that, it's essentially terminal. Means that it's not going to happen instantly, but things will get worse and worse and it'll be irreversible. Uh, the crucial fact, as Bob Pollan has shown in his work, is that we can de deal with it but it's not going to happen by itself. And unfortunately, there are, the steps being taken right now are inadequate. There are some places where it's doing pretty well, others badly. There's one country, unfortunately, the most important country in the world where things are going backwards. And uh, a large part of the population simply is unaware of the need to move forward. Just today, the Yale University regular study of uh, uh, popular attitudes towards climate change just came out with their latest analysis. They broke it down into six Americas, depending on which news sources they pay attention to, uh, CNN, NPR, Fox News, and so on. The frightening one is Fox News. Only about a third of the population is even convinced that humans are doing anything to the environment. About uh, most, uh, and maybe a tiny percentage, maybe 10 or 15 percent, think it's an urgent problem. Uh, the figures aren't marvelous for the other news sources, but much better. And remember, that's almost half the population. So there's a long way to go. And the reason why is perfectly obvious. You listen to Fox News, that's what they tell you. Listen to the president, that's what he tells you. In fact, he tells you there's nothing. Just go ahead and use all the fossil fuels you want. 
So there's a extremely serious problem. Don't have a lot of time to deal with it. Can be dealt with. Other countries have their own problems. Thank you, Professor Chomsky. For Professor Pollan, how do you feel capitalism is implicated in the climate crisis as it has evolved to date? Well, if we want to talk about what is holding up any kind of progress towards climate stabilization, we had to summarize it. It's ca capitalist profits. In particular, it's the profits of the fossil fuel industry. Um, and they have trillions of dollars at stake. Uh, if we really stop burning fossil fuels, which we need to do, they will lose trillions of dollars in their existing assets. So, you know, that isn't what you exactly hear on Fox News, as Noam was talking about, but that's what's underlying what's going on on Fox News. Uh, they, on Fox News, they try to convince everybody that this is bad for everybody. Um, it's definitely bad for the profits of the oil companies. It is also bad for the jobs of the people that work in the fossil fuel industry, but I've done a lot of work on this with, with co-authors. It's a very easy problem to fix with a minimal amount of commitment and effort to establish a just transition for the workers and communities that will be negatively impacted by the transition. But capitalist profits in the fossil fuel industry are at the center of what is uh, holding back any kind of progress. On the other hand, it is not the case that we have to think about overturning capitalism as a system in order to get on a, a clean energy uh, climate stabilization path. There's a couple of reasons for that. Number one, it's true the fossil fuel industry profits uh, will be destroyed, but it doesn't mean that the ca capitalist profits in general have to be. Maybe we want them to be, and in fact, Profits should go down. We've had 40 years of neoliberalism, which has been about delivering profits for capitalists and maintaining stagnating incomes or declining incomes for everybody else. So uh, that's true, but you know, the rest of the capitalist economy can operate just fine on clean energy. They don't, they don't need fossil fuels. Uh, we can operate the economy at high efficiency and with renewable energy and capitalists can still function. And again, we would want them to function differently in a more egalitarian framework, but we can move towards climate stabilization and achieve a uh, egalitarian, stable climate economy within the framework of capitalism. It's just the fossil fuel industry, yes, that is going to have to be shut down to zero. I'm looking forward to coming back to the idea of a just transition with you, Professor Pollan. Uh, before we go on to that, maybe just to, to stick with capitalism for a second, um, a question for Professor Chomsky. I wonder, would you comment on the role that Donald Trump has played and continues to play in this course of events? I can explain it very easily in two words, wrecking ball. <laughs> it's uh, we can elaborate, but that's what it is. His commitments, his programs are maximize the use of fossil fuels, disregard the, uh, eliminate the regulatory system that mitigates their effects, that saves people from the effects of mercury pollution and waters, uh, air pollution, uh, which is very, which is a killer and is magnified by the respiratory disease. Forget all about that. Kill as many people as you as you want. Destroy the prospects for human life. Increase the profits for my friends. That's it in a nutshell. Okay, it's and the fact that this is happening in the most powerful country in human history. The consequences are indescribable. It's almost everywhere that you look. So right now, for example, there's a international conference underway on what to do about the uh, on biodiversity, what to do about the enormous impact of destruction of the environment for 
all of animal life and plant life too. Uh, almost every country is involved. One country refuses to attend, Donald Trump. What do we care if uh, uh, the sixth extinction continues and uh, uh, species are devastated at the level of 65 million years ago? Okay, what do I care? I'm doing fine. My friends are doing fine. So let's wipe out the world. Okay, we won't even attend the conference. I mean, it's the same on other issues, incidentally. Take the pandemic. There is an international consortium which is working on cooperating and developing vaccines and paying some attention, not enough, but at least some, to the serious distributional problems. How to ensure that an eventual vaccine will reach uh, the people who need it, not just the people who can pay for it. Uh, Covax, uh, Trump just pulled out, what do we care? Harms Americans, means if it slows down the move to a vaccine, do much better cooperating. If someone else gets the vaccine, Americans die. Right now, for example, it looks as though China is in the lead in testing usable vaccines. And health specialists in the United States take that pretty seriously. So suppose they get a vaccine first. Now we can't use it because Trump has to blame China for his malevolence in killing tens of thousands of Americans. So we'll kill lots more. That's fine. We have to make sure two things, profits for the people who matter and my personal prestige and power. That's the be all and end all. So that's Donald Trump. It is frightening. Thank you so much, Professor Johnson. And I'm going to introduce um, Constantine Bustalis, who has a question about the Republican Party. So Constantine is an assistant professor of environmental politics and quantitative methods in the political science department at Trinity College. Uh, would you like to go ahead whenever you're ready, Constantine? Yes, uh, I hope that you can hear me clearly. Um, so uh, just a question, uh, moving a little bit outside of the leadership right now in the White House, but um, focusing on the Republican Party, which has always been the obstacle of uh, comprehensive uh, climate solution, basically in the United States. Um, how, uh, how, um, how, how, do you, how do you feel, uh, Professor Chomsky, about um, the prospects of changing minds within the party? So not just uh, the elected officials, but also the voters themselves. Uh, as, you, as you point out in the book, there's a chasm between uh, Democrat voters um, and Republican voters on this issue. Well, we could learn something by looking back a little at the recent history. Uh, as recently as 2008, the Republican candidate for president, John McCain, uh, actually had a limited climate uh, element in his program. Not strong, but at least something. Now, the Republican Party at the time, legislators, were considering inadequate, but at least some moves like a some kind of carbon tax, for example, not the right one, but some kind. Something happened. The Koch brothers energy conglomerate, which had been working for years to try to ensure that the Republican Party would be solidly in support of maximizing use of fossil fuels, they were enraged. Uh, the late David Koch took the lead, organized an enormous campaign to try to beat the Republican Party back into line. Everything was tried. Uh, huge lobbyists, intimidation, uh, bribery, uh, astroturf groups knocking on doors. Uh, they turned. Since then, the Republican Party has been denialist. Incidentally, this happens on issue after issue. Why do Republicans now are very strongly opposed to abortion. Why? In the 1960s, they were in favor of, free, of choice. 
women's choice. Uh, Ronald Reagan was governor of uh, California, passed one of the strongest pro-choice uh, legislations. Uh, George H.W. Bush, the rest of them. What happened? Uh, Paul Weirich, Republican strategist, had a bright idea in the mid 70s. He recognized that if they suddenly pretended to be anti-abortion, they'd pick up the huge evangelical vote and the Northern Catholic vote. So they turned on a dime, okay? We're dealing with people who have zero integrity. They're um, not everyone, you know, there's little bits and pieces of it here and there. But overall, there's essentially no integrity. You do what maximizes your own power and the profit of those you're working for. Okay, that's basically the way it works. Can this change? Yeah. Popular opinion can make a change. In fact, it's happening. You look at uh, boardrooms now of major corporations, they're nervous. They're nervous about what they call reputational risk meaning the peasants are coming with the pitchforks. We're in trouble. Uh, so therefore they're changing their line. Uh, the business round table, just, you know, main lobbying agency just came out with a statement, by, uh, I think 150 or so hotshot executives saying, uh, we realize we've been making mistakes. Uh, we apologize. Uh, you know, things have been pretty bad for all you people. We've been making profits, it's a mistake. We've learned from our errors. Now we're going to change. We're going to be dedicated from now on to stakeholders, communities, the workforce. We're going to be working for you. So put your faith in us. Same thing dramatically happened at the Davos conference last January. That's where the rich and powerful gather every year at a fancy Swiss resort. They usually self-congratulatory. This year was different. There was a concern. They're coming after us. We have to do something. So they produced essentially the same message as the business roundtable CEOs. Uh, if you're old enough to remember, as I am, back in the 1950s, uh, there was a move to show that these are what are called soulful corporations not just after power and profit, but full of human sympathy and empathy and working for the benefit of all. So now we're getting soulful corporations back. The banks are worried. There's disinvestment. Uh, huge investors are pulling out. They're in trouble. So how can we deal with it? Make more trouble. Come with the pitchforks. That'll make a difference. They have to listen. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Chomsky. Thanks, Constantine. And hopefully we'll come back to this issue of social mobilization in a couple of minutes. Before we do that, I have a question for Professor Pollan. How would the viable global Green New Deal work in practice? This is the main thesis of your book. I was wondering if you'd like to expand on that. Yeah, I want to emphasize that the basics of a global Green New Deal are actually quite simple. And it works easily, at least at the level of analysis and economics, um, in all countries. Obviously, it has to be adjusted. But the basic features are that we substitute away from fossil fuels uh, a given percentage a year, depending on the country, say 5% a year. Uh, and we uh, substitute in a high efficiency economy and renewable energy. And uh, that is completely viable now. The technologies are straightforward. There's nothing fancy about it at this point. I mean, of course there can be improvements in technology, but the what we know is that renewable energy, uh, clean renewable energy, and when I say clean, I'm excluding uh, biofuels that are burning coal and wood, which are as dirty as, as coal. Okay, so the others, solar, wind, uh, geothermal, small scale hydro, um, they are at cost uh, parity, are average equal to or lower than fossil fuels. 
that the evidence we have on that is uh, overwhelming. Uh, we have it from there's an agency uh, called the International Renewable Energy Agency, ARENA, that's actually in Abu Dhabi, and they put out this information every year. Uh, it's very clear that it, in all parts of the world, to deliver a kilowatt of electricity with solar energy is equal to or less than coal or natural gas on average. Uh, in addition, if you invest in high efficiency, it's easy to see how we can raise efficiency standards. In other words, get the same energy services uh, for using less energy. In other words, using LED lights in houses, improving insulation in houses, uh, using public transportation instead of private cars, to the extent we use private cars, uh, we use electric vehicles. All these technologies are already available. And so that it's really a question of just making the initial investments, moving them forward. And in doing so, keep in mind that this is an investment project. In the US, we always hear about, well, look, even if you don't like US imperialism, the defense to budget is, is critical for people because it creates a lot of jobs. And that is true, it does create a lot of jobs. But if you invest in a green economy, you create more jobs than you would in the military. So it is a big source of job creation. And I've done research with uh, co-workers in all parts of the world actually on the job impacts of investing in a green economy at around two to 3% of the overall economy of GDP in all countries, in Sub-Saharan Africa, in India, in China, in Brazil, in Greece, in Spain, in the US, in Puerto Rico, they, we get the same results. So it's pretty straightforward that you create a lot of jobs, you can deliver energy at equal or lower costs, uh, and by the way, you're saving the environment. So that's the central thesis in my view of the Green New Deal. Would you mind explaining where the initial investment funding comes from? Okay, so uh, the initial investment funding uh, can come from anywhere. I mean, we're, we're thinking about, say, 3% of GDP, which is, it's a lot of money in absolute terms. Uh, for the global economy, it's a, like $2 trillion per year, um, something like that. Um, but it's still only 2%. Uh, now, where could it come from? So as we talk about in the book, uh, we talk about the four basic sources, you can add others, uh, but one uh, would be eliminating all the uh, existing subsidies for fossil fuels, which are actually huge. Uh, the, the problem though in eliminating the subsidies for fossil fuels is that to a large extent in developing countries, these are a form of uh, fighting poverty. They're, it's a way of redistributing income by giving people cheap energy. But unfortunately, it's cheap fossil fuel energy. So you can take a lot of that money that is going towards the fossil fuel subsidies, transfer it into clean energy subsidies, and people will still get cheap uh, energy. So that's number one. Uh, number two, we just cut military budgets. Uh, we, you know, we can argue about how much military budgets can, should be cut. Uh, you know, in the US, maybe you could cut 90% of the military budget, but trying to be realistic in terms of politics, really I, in the book, we just propose a 5% cut in military budget. And, and that also then becomes a major source of funding. And of course, most of the funding from the, if we cut military budgets across the board, across everywhere in the world, most of it's gonna come from the US because the US's military budget is bigger than, you know, uh, the other 15 next biggest countries combined. Okay, so that's number two. Uh, number three would be a carbon tax. Uh, carbon tax is uh, okay policy if, if, if you take a lot of the revenue that you generate and you give it back to people. And so actually the simple example that's in the book, we have a carbon tax, global carbon tax, and then you give 75% of the revenue back to everybody. Everybody in the world gets $60. Uh, 
Now, for somebody in the U.S., sixty dollars is nothing. You know, it's you know, it's it's a it's a food for two days. Uh, but in a country like Kenya, it's like three or four percent of your income. So that is also very egalitarian, a carbon tax with redistribution. And then finally, we can think about uh, just the same kind of funding that's being used now to bail out the US and Europe from the uh, pandemic recession. That is essentially creating money. The Federal Reserve, we don't know exactly how much they pump into the Wall Street, but it's somewhere in the range of six to eight trillion dollars about two, uh, about 20% of US GDP. The European Central Bank has a different mode of operation, but they're also at that scale. So they, they could fund the whole thing easily by just operating, creating, you know, we can call them green bonds and let uh, uh, governments throughout the world and, and regions uh, borrow money, green bonds at zero interest, never pay it back. Uh, and so that combination, and there's, you know, you can do it in different detailed ways, but that combination can easily finance a global Green New Deal at roughly 3% of global GDP over 30 years. And if we cost it all out, you can get to the point where you have a 100% clean renewable energy economy within 30 years. Thank you so much for that, Professor Paolo. And I would like to introduce Peter Stone, who has a question for Professor Chomsky. So Peter Stone is an associate professor of political science at Trinity College Dublin. And he interviewed you in June for the Bertrand Russell Society, Professor Chomsky. So Peter, whenever you like, uh, you, you might unmute your, your audio there. Got it. Uh, very good. Um, wonderful to talk to you again, uh, Professor Chomsky. Uh, my question for you today relates to the inspiration for the Green New Deal, uh, with you know the original New Deal back in the 1930s, uh, one of the most successful uh, periods of reform in American history. Um, I know you've thought uh, a lot about social movements and the process of political reform. And I'd love to know if you think there are lessons that we can draw from the New Deal experience as we press on with the drive for a Green New Deal now. Very definitely. Actually, I should say that these are very vivid childhood memories. So partly personal, partly studying it. My, my family was a first generation immigrant, uh, working class. Uh, not much education, uh, unemployed. Uh, the first, the depression hit in 1929. There were a couple of years of just devastation. Took about five years for things to pick up. The labor movement had been totally smashed in the 1920s. The United States had a very vibrant, vigorous labor movement. It was crushed by mostly state force. Finally, Woodrow Wilson's Red Scare. So the 1920s were a little bit like the past recent years. Uh, then it all crashed. Uh, so, and countries went in different directions. Some went to fascism, which was pretty strongly supported here, I should say. Uh, some uh, dithered finally in the United States. After th three or four years, you started getting revival of the labor movement. Uh, CIO began to organize, soon became pretty active and militant. Uh, they got to the level by the mid thirties of uh, sit down strikes. Sit down strikes are very frightening to the owners for a very simple reason. They are one step before saying, we don't need you. We can run the thing by ourselves. They don't have to say that, but it's in the back of your mind. And they can, in fact. So there was a sympathetic administration, which is crucial. And uh, that combination of militant labor action, lots of political action, 
all sorts of political parties, activism and so on. Uh, that combination with a sympathetic administration led to the New Deal. It, it had an enormous effect. It didn't end the depression, but it enormously changed people's lives. I mean, you could just see it. The, there was a sense of hopefulness. You were, I mean, I could tell you my, my seamstress aunts who were uh, unemployed, uh, tech, you know, uh, were able to join the ILGU, International Ladies Garment Workers Union. They had cultural programs, educational programs, uh, even a couple of weeks in the Catskills you know, for a vacation to the Union camp. But there was a life and there was hope. Things were being done. You could see uh, construction was being carried out for public purposes. Some of it enormous, like the TVA, which completely rev revitalized the, the whole Appalachian region. The Dust Bowl was taken care of, finally, with decent agricultural practices in the cities. Uh, uh, there were things were happening that you get involved in, and uh, there was it, it was psychologically very different from today. There was a, it was much worse in absolute terms, but there was a sense we're going to get out of this. We're working together. We have a government that's supportive. We're going to find a way out. So let's get going. And now there's just sense of despair. There's even deaths of despair, something unknown in advanced societies. In the United States, uh, a working age men, white men primarily, 25 to 40, you're increasing mortality. It, 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 death rates are increasing. That, that doesn't happen in developed societies. Deaths of despair, they call them. Very strikingly different. Uh, Eric Loomis, very good labor historian, has studied a long series of uh, strikes and their outcomes, labor actions and outcomes. Turns out that they only succeed when there's a moderately sympathetic administration. That combination is critical. Uh, if, if state power is lined up with capitalist power to crush uh, steps towards the common good, they can succeed. Uh, if there's a moderately sympathetic administration and there's dedicated, organized, sometimes militant action, you can get results. Uh, the New Deal is an example. Its benefits last, are, to some extent still, they've been, they continued through the 1940s, 1950s and 60s. 1970s, you begin to get erosion. There's a regression. And then comes the neoliberal period, as Bob mentioned, which is just a hammer blow against the population. But one of the things it's attempting to do is dismantle the New Deal visions, uh, not because they're failing, but because they don't lead to enough profit for the rich. But we should bear in mind what has happened for the last 40 years, which is the background for the Trump malevolence and carries it to an extreme. Now, there was just an estimate carried out by the uh, very respectable Wren Corporation of how much money was transferred, their word, I would say robbed, but they say transferred from the working class and the middle class to the very rich during the last 40 years. $47 trillion. Okay, where are you going to pay for the money for the Green New Deal? Well, $47 trillion were robbed from the lower 90% of the population over a trillion dollars a year by policies designed for that purpose. And it's not that they went to the top 10%. They went mostly to the very top, the 0.1%. 0.1% of the population now has 20% of the country's wealth. That's twice what they had when Reagan came in. And 
executive salaries, CEO salaries have shot into the stratosphere, carrying management strategies up, salaries up with them all over university presidents, uh, businesses, and so on. All of that is just sheer robbery of the general public. And it's only part of it. Uh, takes, take uh, tax havens and shell companies, techniques for avoiding taxes. Prior to 1980, they were illegal and the Treasury Department enforced the laws. Reagan opened the spigot. You got a huge industry of lawyers, tax evasion lawyers, enormous industry now, and they do their work. Uh, the biggest corporation in the world, Apple, they don't bother paying taxes. Uh, they have an office in Ireland, which is you know, probably the size of my study, where maybe there's a secretary once in a while. So they're an Irish company. So they don't have to pay taxes. Uh, uh, British Virgin Islands, uh, uh, Luxembourg, there's places all over the world where you can, if you have a fancy raft of lawyers, you can figure out a way to avoid taxes. And we just noticed how Donald Trump has managed for the last 15 years. Okay, that, nobody knows how much that is. It's all hidden. But the rough estimates are in the tens of trillions of dollars. More robbery. So there are lots of ways to rob the public. There's plenty of wealth out there that shouldn't be there. And this is what the population has been living with for 40 years. So n not surprisingly, people are pretty angry. The anger is unfocused. It's easily mobilized by demagogues. We see that in many places. And uh, we're now on a situation where we can go back to the New Deal spirit and engagement, get to work together jointly, much richer country than it was then, many more resources, lots of opportunities, but you have to take, you have to grasp them and work with them. It certainly can be done. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Shamsi. Thank you, Peter Stone. Um, Professor Pollan, would you like to say anything about the New Deal and its influence um, and or around, anything around social mobilization and how to place pressure on governments to move towards a Green New Deal? Yes. Well, first, uh, I, I really appreciated hearing Noam's description of the New Deal. I would mention one uh, massive problem with the New Deal was that it was founded on racism. Uh, the the uh, Roosevelt administration felt like they had to make a pact with the Southern Democrats to get votes. And so that they uh, really excluded African-Americans from almost all the benefits of the New Deal. And we're still living with the consequences of that. So the first thing, obviously, when we think about a current Green New Deal, which is an egalitarian program and a uh, ecological program, is that obviously we have to uh, purge it of any uh, semblances of racism. It has to be open uh, to everybody. And in, in some of the work that I've been doing, looking at who has the jobs now that will be in the uh, Green New Deal. So if we, there are gonna be a lot of construction jobs, manufacturing jobs, and those are predominantly held by white males now. So that in the Green New Deal, what we also need to focus on are uh, first of all, strong unions that will uh, raise wages in the green economy, because the fact is uh, on average wages are higher. Coal miners, uh, people laying pipeline for uh, natural gas and, and oil, they make 30, 35% more than an average person that would be some working in the, uh, in the solar industry or wind. And, and that's not just true in the United States. Uh, I mean, I've, I've looked at it for Spain, I've looked at it for Greece. If somebody asks me about Ireland, I'll look at it for Ireland. Um, but uh, so we need, uh, we need a strong union presence, as Noam was saying, um, the, the unions uh, grew tremendously because there was a, a, a supportive administration. So unionization has to be part of the Green New Deal. Affirmative action has to be part of the Green New Deal. The jobs have to be open to everybody. 
I will say that under Obama, when they did uh, introduce some of the, what we now call a Green New Deal, they did have a pretty ambitious green investment program as part of the stimulus. They did make efforts also to open up uh, these jobs for underrepresented groups, women and, uh, and uh, people of color. And so that has to also be integrated into the Green New Deal. And then the other part of the Green New Deal is just, let's, as Noam said, let's just go ahead and do it. I mean, really do it. Um, use, we have the financial resources, not just in the United States, but globally. And let's use the financial resources. It would be wonderful if we come up with new, cheaper, uh, effective technologies. We don't have to though. The technologies that we have and at the cost that we have uh, that we can, we can run the Green New Deal now at relatively modest investments. And oh, I forgot to mention when I said that the evidence on the cost structures for solar, wind and so forth relative to fossil fuels, I mentioned the international renewable energy as a source. Another source is the US Department of Energy, the Donald Trump US Department of Energy. They put out uh, um, statistics on the costs, relative costs of fossil fuels versus renewable energy every year. I was just looking at the document yesterday. Uh, the, their own, the, the Trump's own administration, and by the way, the people that work in the energy department are not even allowed to use the term climate change in a memo. That said, if you look at their own documents, it shows that the cost of solar power, wind power, geothermal power are lower than uh, fossil fuel energy and nuclear. Thank you so much, Professor Pollan. And thank you, Peter. I have uh, Jason Ruggel on the line as well. So Jason is Assistant Professor of International Law at Leiden University in the Netherlands and has a question for you, Professor Chomsky. Yes, hello, uh, Professors Chomsky and uh, Paulin. It's a, it's a great privilege to, to have the chance to engage with you on your new book, um, which I found fascinating. I read it at the weekend. Um, in your book, uh, you suggest that the uh, reasons why uh, uh, the Paris Agreement on climate change might not have the teeth that it uh, should have. But um, Professor Chomsky, do you think the approach taken by the Paris Agreement based on voluntary uh, nationally determined contributions of greenhouse gas uh, emission reductions is really appropriate in light of the urgency of the climate crisis? Certainly not, and we should look at the background. The original goal of the Paris negotiations was to reach a treaty with a binding treaty uh, with uh, penalties for failure to meet the conditions. Couldn't do it. Why? The Republican Party in the United States. They simply would not accept it. They would not accept any binding commitments. So Obama was in fact pushing it. It was partly his initiative, but it had to be left as you describe. And just say, if I feel like it, I'll do it. Of course, that's not going to work. Actually, even the, what they were agreeing to was nowhere near what has to be done. But if it had been at least binding, it would have been some kind of step. But the Republican Party, we can go back to the energy conglomerates which bought them off. Uh, okay, can't do it. So sure, that's not possible. We have to have uh, dedicated commitments and at a much higher level than the Paris negotiations. Thank you, Professor Chomsky. Thank you so much, Jason. One last question from me. Um, for both Professor Chomsky and Professor Pollan, what do you feel academics can do to assist the broader movement to address the climate crisis and our interdisciplinary academic endeavors and publications such as your own book, Essential in, in Strengthening the Fight Against Climate Change, or does it have to happen at a grassroots level or both? Well, academics are also human beings. Uh, they don't <laughs> only sit in the 
uh, study somewhere in the library. So they can be out in public trying to reach the general public to the extent that you can. It's not easy to get on television, okay? That's, uh, but there are many ways to reach the public. Mm -hmm. You take a look at the movements that have succeeded. They had no public exposure. Uh, the huge anti-war movement in the 1960s, the media hated it. It wasn't just you couldn't get exposure, you were being constantly denounced, like criminals and so on, took off. Uh, take the feminist movement, also the beginnings were in the 60s, vilified, ridiculed, uh, you know, don't want to go into it, but took off, okay, broke through. Uh, the biggest uh, popular demonstration in US history was in 40 years ago, 1982, anti-nuclear demonstrations, huge demonstrations, was through popular organizing and activism, had major effects. One of the effects was to lead to the uh, INF Treaty, the Reagan-Gorbachev INF Treaty, which significantly reduced the threat of war. Uh, Trump just tore it to shreds, but uh, was in power there for a long time. Uh, you don't need to go, I mean, it would be nice to be able to use the, the national, international media, but they're not going to be helpful. But there are plenty of other ways to reach people, and they succeed. They've made a big difference over the years. Uh, same is true in the New Deal. So that's things that you can do. Very positive. Thank you. Um, Professor Pollan, any further thoughts? Yeah, well, I would just say, first of all, um, you know, without the really wonderful, important work of climate scientists, I, I myself, I wouldn't have anything to say. Um, so the work of uh, hundreds, thousands of climate scientists that have identified the problem and uh, made it clear uh, to non-specialists is critical. I mean, there's, there's three at my own university who are active with the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and they're doing fantastic work. And they, all, all, they weren't necessarily all specialists in this exact field. They, they moved their specialty. So we have to learn from the climate scientists and we have to respect uh, you know, the body of work that's come out of that, um, critical. Uh, in terms of general academics, yeah, I mean, as Noam said, I mean, we're just people. So do what we can. Uh, I myself have really been privileged to work with a lot of activist groups, um, mo mainly in the US, but around the world uh, in, in different countries. And I've, you know, a lot of what my work is just trying to answer the questions that they ask of me, the ones that they think they need to know uh, in order to move forward. Uh, for example, uh, you know, groups in Puerto Rico asked me to come down after the devastation there in 2017. Uh, you know, wiped out a year of GDP, the, the hurricanes there. So what do we do? Black Foundation. So those are great questions. And right now I'm doing work with uh, labor groups in the United States on building Green New Deal policies at the state level. And we have had breakthroughs, for example, in Colorado, the study I did last year was actually endorsed by the building trades, which had been, have been vehemently opposed to anything to do with environment, anything. They don't want to hear it, but they're starting to hear it. So if you're, if you're going to connect the environmental groups and labor activists, you really got the core of the life of the Democratic Party other than the corporate Democrats. And so that's really, I think, going to be the driving force in this country, and I think we'll see similar patterns elsewhere. Thank you so much for that. I'm conscious we're close to the time. Um, and sorry, we won't have a chance to answer all of the questions, but I'd love to take up the discussion with the attendees after the webinar. Just wanted to say that it's been a great honor for us to speak with you both this evening. And um, the arguments outlined in Climate Crisis and the Global Green New Deal, I feel we're extremely persuasive and it's important to promote and spread this message uh, as far and wide as possible. 
We face a confluence of challenges at this time, but your thesis in the book offers a coherent message of, of hope and a realistic blueprint for change. And we thank you for that. I'm just wondering, is there anything you'd like to say before we close the session? Anything that we didn't touch on that maybe you'd like to mention, but no, no pressure. I'll just say thanks for having me. Thank you. Just to add, get to work. That's a good message. Thank you so much. Um, so I'd like to again express my sincere and utmost gratitude to Professor Chomsky and Professor Pollan for sharing their valuable insights with the college community and beyond, and for working tirelessly towards the betterment of society for our generation and for generations to come. Uh, and with that, I'll close the session. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.